Welcome to High Heels in the High Country, I'm Rob Cope Williams. Rural communities are facing many challenges, there's the isolation and also falling populations, but thankfully for the last 80 years one organisation has been advocating for rural communities and really making a difference. Not surprisingly, it's run by women. Kerry Moore grew up in Christchurch before marrying a farmer and moving to farm at Dorry, south of Rakaia in the Ashburton district. Along the way, her working career has included stints in public relations, media and communications management, project management, biosecurity and 10 years in the South Island management team of the MAF Quality Management's Meat Inspection Service. With such a busy professional life and a young family, it's almost surprising that Kerry found time or even the need to join Rural Women New Zealand. I guess it went back to when I first moved out into the rural area from the city, um, that needing to meet people and um, get involved in sort of uh, that social connection, um, deal with that isolation loneliness, but also um, I wanted to be involved in the community in terms of giving back. Um, there was a period in my life where the community was incredibly supportive to me in a way that I don't think I can ever repay. And um, I just want to give back and say, well, look, you know, I can give something back and, and try and make things better for other people. And I guess that's a big part of why I do it is, you know, just trying to make a difference in other people's lives. Kerry's been giving back to her community through the many and varied roles she's taken on with Rural Women New Zealand. Presently I'm um, National Vice President, um, but the majority of my work sees me in, in Canterbury as the councillor for the Canterbury region, which is right through from sort of up the Cheviot down to the Waitaki and across to the, the main divide. So um, the representative and also our, uh, we have portfolios in our particular interest areas and in advocacy, so my area is in education, so I'm our national education spokesperson and working on issues uh, affecting rural communities, rural people around education. Rural Women New Zealand was initially set up in 1925 by women who wanted better social and economic conditions for rural people. 80 years on, Rural Women is the leading representative organisation promoting and advocating on rural health, education, land and social issues. We spend a lot of time um, advocating directly to, with politicians, meeting with them in select committees and so on, and trying to get that rural voice heard in the policy making and um, making sure that they understand the impact of their legislation changes in rural communities. So we do a lot of that behind the scenes advocating, both at the central government and even at local government level when it's needed. The advocacy isn't just for rural women. The issues affecting women are often the same issues affecting men and families in rural communities. One of the ones that we've worked on a lot lately has been obviously the school bus safety, you know, slowing down around the school bus, around to the 20Ks and slowing down around schools to make it safer for our children. Um, we've also taken on issues around freedom camping and um, we're really pleased to see a lot of councils have picked that up with bylaws, um, with fines and, and um, enforcement of that with issues around freedom camping. And um, we've taken on issues around home care and you know having a reasonable wage for home care workers and travel, particularly travel costs, which currently are not reimbursed at a, at a standard rate, uh, much lower than the normal. And it's making it very difficult for us to actually have people in the rural sector to um, help people in their homes. So you know those are just some of the issues we've taken on recently. And medical services, of course, are. Yeah, we, we, we do talk frequently with the Ministry of Health about resourcing um, in terms of both GPs, um, practice nurses, midwives, and all the um, support services, you know, whether it be counselling or um, physiotherapy or all those other add-on um, health issues, and making sure we've got good, well-trained resources out in the rural area because often those um, services get centralised back into the towns or the cities and rural people have to travel. And if you're already unwell and you've then got to travel to, to get therapy or or assistance of any kind, it just makes it a lot harder for you. So we try to make sure that that's um, taken into account with planning for staffing in the rural areas. The determination to put rural issues in the forefront of political life led to Rural Women New Zealand's producing a manifesto prior to the 2011 election. 
In the manifesto, rural women advised the government on the issues creating disparities for rural communities and offered solutions. We produced one for the last general election and um, rural women are currently working through our draft and it'll be ready for release in July ahead of the next election. And we talk about the issues that we see as being important for rural people, things like um, education. Um, one of the areas we're particularly interested in now is the government's new um, investment for education success. Um, the IES, they've put 360 million against that and um, sounds great on paper, but you know, how will it actually work for rural communities when you've got, um, you know, the, the hub of that system seems to be to have a hub of schools working together and providing resources, but you know, in the rural sector you might only have one school, so how is that actually going to work and how will that be funded and how will that be resourced for rural, rural schools, you know, the, the practicalities. So we'll be looking at that. We're also, um, in terms of our health, we're looking again at resourcing of people, we're looking at the mental health side of things, we're still looking at um, social issues around family violence in the rural sector, we also look at land use issues such as um, walking access, biosecurity, biodiversity, um, food safety, so there's a lot of issues that um, relate to rural that we'll be putting into that uh, manifesto which is around saying to government, look these are the things we think are important and, and enabling people to open discussion with the candidates and just say, well, look, what's your party going to do about it? And, and um, from that, they can decide how they may or may not vote. Despite entering a male-dominated industry, Kate and Genevieve are getting a solid grounding of how it all works at Lincoln University. And they're fighting stereotypes about women working on farms. One of the major concerns as far as the farming community is concerned is who's going to be running the farms in future generations. Amber went out to Lincoln University to meet up with some young women who are training for a career in the rural sector. stepping stones into the agriculture industry. These two young girls are studying towards a future not many are choosing to follow. It's definitely not like a 50-50 split, no. but like there's way more girls than I thought there would be. Despite entering a male-dominated industry, Kate and Genevieve are getting a solid grounding of how it all works at Lincoln University. And they're fighting stereotypes about women working on farms. I think the general comment is people can't believe the number of actually attractive girls here. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite funny, people's perceptions. What do you think people do think when they think of University of Lincoln? Gumboots and like farm bogans. Yeah, just real like, gross sort of, like yeah, just farmers and like, <laughs> yeah, not. <laughs> but primitive, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. yeah. Genevieve no, studying fun. a four year yeah. degree yeah. of a Bachelor yeah. of Agriculture yeah. Science yeah. with big plans of what she wants to do with life after university. It's kind of the big question, mm -hmm. isn't it? <laughs> um, there's so many opportunities really for people graduating, like this people coming to the uni like I've had job offers already in that second year. Several people say, hey, can we employ you yet? <laughs> but no, sorry, got a while to go. But um, for myself, um, I see myself um, sort of an educator, I suppose. I'm really interested in biological farming. Um, so sort of educating people, sort of an alternative route or sort of an approach to it. Um, yeah, eventually farm ownership. Kick dad off, go home. While Kate's studying a Bachelor of Commerce, majoring in farm management, and she's already locked down a job once she graduates. So it's an 18 month program and you do three, three rotations around the business and yeah, you eventually go into rural banking. Genevieve grew up on a farm in the North Island with... Um, sheep, beef, deer, cropping, forestry <laughs> and dairy support. Which has helped not hindered her interest in agriculture. I suppose growing up on the family farm, I had a rather large influence, but um, I suppose sort of going to high school, really enjoyed science and sort of... I know, just the more you, I suppose it was, I got really excited about understanding stuff in the classroom and then relating it back to actually what's happening on farm around me. So that's what, yeah, led me to keep 
studying science. For Kate, she grew up on a 1,000 cow dairy farm in Burnham, but she didn't always plan on entering the rural sector, originally planning to enrol at the University of Canterbury. And I just realised how many opportunities there are in the agriculture industry. Um, yeah, just thought it was a really relevant degree and mm. yeah, and it's paid off, like I, yeah, I've got myself a job already which is awesome. But the pair aren't concerned about entering a male dominated industry. I think that perception has sort of changed mm. now. Um, traditionally it would have been male dominated but not so much anymore, like there's heaps of women in agribusiness. Um, I know, because we've got... Like within the year group, like living in the halls, you've made so many friends with all these guys, and they all respect you and like value what you've got to say, and will come and ask for help and stuff. So it's like, I don't know. I don't think I think coming forward, like these are all the people we're going to be going into, like with the next generation really, and yeah, I don't think it's going to be such an issue. With such good heads on their shoulders, the pair are set to be the next leaders in the agriculture sector. How does a farmer's wife adjust to life in town? She doesn't. Mandy Kane wasn't ready to become a lady who lunched, so she planted up her lifestyle block with horseradish and using an old family recipe set up a business. As it grew, she partnered with Mandy Steele, who now owns and runs the very successful Mandy's Horseradish Sources. It's an easy crop to grow, but it's, uh, it's, it's a hard crop to harvest. It's, uh, it propagates itself, so every year it'll grow back. So I, um, I'll plant it, I plant it from cuttings in raised beds, uh, and then the first year will be, it takes 12 months to grow. And what I'm actually finding is it's taking 18 months to grow. So I leave it in the ground and I actually don't do anything to it. Um, I might weed it and, uh, and then mound it up again a couple of times throughout that year. Uh, and then I will um, harvest it after, when it's ready, sort of 12, 18 months later on. So, um, no, very easy to grow. It's a wee bit like a weed. <laughs> but it's been a very hard season with lots of rain for the last two winters. Yeah, it has. So um, what I'm learning as the years go by is that horseradish um, needs an even amount of sun, a good amount of rain and a good amount of uh, frost and actually when we have winters that when it snows, I have really good crops then because the, the heat in the plant is just astronomical. It's great and people love that. So, um, so yeah, but this year has been just not so great. There's just been too much rain and the yields are just tiny, which is not good. When Mandy does have a crop to harvest, it's a very labor intensive process. The rough shaped horse radish have to be harvested peeled and processed by hand. Once the horseradish sauce is made, there's the job of finding customers to buy it. Actually, to be fair, we've been very lucky with the marketing <laughs> because I, was, I suppose having such a great product, um, a lot of people have come to us and say, can we please stock your product? And I love that, that's great. Um, and, uh, but in saying that, I do still work hard at the marketing. I, um, I go to food shows and I do events like uh, Fates and AMP shows, which I love because that's really my market. What are people using it for? Oh gosh, predominantly they have it with a steak or roast beef. Um, but I'm finding that more and more people are using it with um, smoked fish, which is delicious. I love it with salmon. I, um, I mix it with a bit of creme fraiche and I have uh, a dollop of horseradish and some chopped up dill and maybe some capers in there and mix it with, a, um, makes it into sort of a mayonnaise consistency and then I um, serve it with salmon, it's delicious, it's good. But otherwise just roast beef and your Yorkshire pudding and gravy and horseradish sauce, it's pretty good. <laughs> The festival, which is created by garden owner Penny Zeno and friend Alison Mayer, is an opportunity for established and emerging New Zealand artists to display and sell their work. Sculptures sit amidst the seven acres of trees, lawns and ponds, while paintings, jewellery, glassware and pottery are exhibited in a restored barn gallery.
productivity on New Zealand farms is growing, but it's not just stock food and crops. We went out to the Hurunui district to find out what's growing in one woman's garden. Flaxmere Garden of National Significance is the setting for the annual Art in the Garden Festival, held for four days over the last weekend in October. Now in its 11th year, the festival, which was created by garden owner Penny Zeno and friend Alison Meyer, is an opportunity for established and emerging New Zealand artists to display and sell their work. Sculptures sit amidst the seven acres of trees, lawns and ponds, while paintings, jewellery, glassware and pottery are exhibited in a restored barn gallery. Throughout the festival, live music filters through the gardens and the visitors can enjoy picnic lunches with wine and coffee. In such a stunning setting, it's hardly surprising that last year over 2,000 people visited the Art in the Garden Festival. Nor is it surprising that exhibiting artists successfully sell their works. For some artists, exhibiting in the Art in a Garden Festival has launched their careers. Definitely has been a launch pad, and they themselves will say, say that, that they have we've seen their work and we've enjoyed their work and, and it's becoming well known now, Art in a Garden is a, is a name that people recognise and, um, and artists in particular and sculptors. What we do is we're basically, Penny is responsible for placing all the sculpture and I do the artwork and we use an old barn that's been converted that um, at the moment probably got a something in it but it, it's correct lighting and um, so it's they're well show, shown off. Um, we also run, which gives Penny and I a great deal of pleasure, we run children's art classes and Bond Suter, we're speaking about Bond, Bond runs a limestone um, workshop and that's, that's well attended and every year we booked out for those and sometimes we do, the, um, Karina Hazlitt has done painting classes and we introduce new um, activities for the children to be able to do. One of the activities we've created and or introduced in the last couple of years is the um, the quiz that they do. They go mm. round and we, they go round and they put their, their thoughts on paper and about what they think about a sculpture. We might say, look for a chair, what does number 11 remind you of? And you can get anything from a chair to a spider or something like that, you know, but it's making children think and, make, and exposing them to art and sculpture. While the children are being introduced to art through entertainment, their parents are buying the artworks. Though not all the exhibits sell over the four-day festival, they do sell. It's amazing. I go on selling during uh, after Art in the Garden, just f through group tours. We've had things go to Australia, some things go to Holland, yeah. all over the place. So and France. Remember yes. the last lot went to France? Yes. Two men arrived on a biking tour, weren't they? They were on a biking, they were some sort of tour and saw the sign and came in and turned out they were art collectors and they went, we'll take this, this and this. Not on their bicycles. No, no, not on their bicycles. I think they were in a van. The freight they? was probably worth more than <laughs> the, what the they bought. Yes. <laughs> Visitors aren't the only ones to fall under the spell of the sculptures. Penny has bought a few of the sculptures herself, rather than let them leave her garden. That was Bond Suter's wonderful yes. liber liberation, which was representing new hope coming out of the broken city of Christchurch. And Actually, I have to admit, I felt it was a bit of history and I bought it myself. It doesn't look as though it's going to go anywhere, Penny. No, <laughs> it's very special. And the piece sits down on the water, there looks like a canoe that's reflected. That's Rebecca Rose, um, and she sent that down last year. Um, you might like to buy it, Rob. <laughs> I don't have enough water in my place, it's the trouble. Oh, well, well perhaps you could rearrange that. <laughs> With sales skills like theirs, it's easy to see why Penny and Alison have made such a success of art in a garden. It's also been a success for the Cancer Society and local Amuri branch of St John, who fundraise at the festival. Despite a decade of success behind them, Penny and Alison are modest about what they've achieved with art in a garden. It's wonderful seeing New Zealand's creativity, and that's what we both feel. We both yes. feel quite humbled by it, really. 
really humbled by it and the joy that people get. And they may come for a variety of reasons. They've enjoyed the drive up, they've come through the, the wine growing area of Waipra, they come into the Ont um, Intermontan Valley through the Weka Pass, they come in through the sleepy little hollow of Waikari and Harden and in here to the garden. And you know where they've suddenly in a magnificent garden with um, every vista you could wish for and all this fantastic art, sculpture and, and glass and all being created and all New Zealand made. It's, it's a thrill. And to see children there enjoying at an early age and listening to music we've got this year, we've got um, three different, we'll have jazz, we'll have um, the Irish band and classical, you see, so on different days and different, then, things. Mm, different things and good food. We get lots of groups coming and look, we've had people who have come every year and every year they say it feeds their soul. So that we couldn't get a higher price than that, could we? Those were our high heels in the high country. Join us again when we celebrate rural women making our country a better place.